This is the Earth Science Classroom. Welcome. This is Coastal Processes video and looking at longshore drift, littoral cells, and nearshore circulation cells. So long story short, this video is all about how the ocean or water or sea or large lake uh, comes in contact with the land and looking at the processes that occur along the beach and the general movement of sediment. So this video is going to basically look at what are literal cells and define longshore drift, longshore current, uh, discuss physical changes along the beach and the shore and coastal zone, and connect these topics with any other topics we discussed in videos and other areas of um, geomorphology, geology, or oceanography. So let's begin. What is nearshore circulation cell or a littoral cell? So we have this basic schematic on the left-hand side here of a coastline or coastal zone, um, an area of the interaction and meeting place between water body and the land. So we have obviously the, the bedrock right here. And we have this certain profile of the beach. And in this case, we have a flat beach. Could be a um, passive margin where any kind of tectonics are basically far away. We have the area, we have the, uh, the backshore and the foreshore and the beach area and the berm, perhaps, or uh, this area of uh, sand built up. So generally the beach. OK, we have here as, you know, classic flat beach, flat, very gentle sloping uh, coastal zone. We have a dune system. We also have a river system which is characterized by basically a rear or a drowned river system delta or estuary or delta that flows into the ocean. So the near shore that basically is from the start of the, basically the sand shoal in, which would be around here, right? Sand shoal is a submerged accumulation of unconsolidated material or sand pebbles under the ocean, under the uh, sea level, and can act as a way to slow down the waves and create a surf zone, basically around here. So this area right here, from the Shoalin area up to the extent of high storm, storm events, where the ocean can reach higher levels or higher positions up in the beach, the back beach area uh, past the initial berm, initial uh, accumulation of sand and ridge, and this basically is the near shore. So what we're looking at is circulation of sediments. It's all about sediment of different sizes. Now, majority of this would be sand, pebbles, gravel, um, clay and silt, maybe, because we also have to include uh, any kind of weathering and erosion that takes place on the land, in the coastal zone, that is brought down towards the ocean through uh, hydrology, through fluvial systems, rivers, river deltas, and the flow of material this way. Now, there is a flow of material also uh, within the ocean, okay, and the coastal area, which is to do with tides, waves and hydraulic action and currents so you're looking at energy from wind energy from um gravitational forces and the tides and you have this this kind of nice um meeting point this balance this system of basically inputs and outputs and the process that goes in between it and an output. And we're going to discuss that in this video. So the term literal or literal, depends where you are, UK or US, uh, that basically comes from the Latin to mean sure. 
and it is a similar classification or region as nearshore and basically it's where um it's basically starts from the submerged area of the um seafloor where light can penetrate so under the under the sea to a certain depth so this can this can vary in in width and uh, size depending on the gradient or slope of the beach, and also the type of beach as well, whether it be cliffed or or flat, and also the length of the continental shelf. And then it goes up until basically the um, storm area as I mentioned before with nearshore. So it includes both under the water and above the water on the beach as this general zone, which we're gonna look at today for circulation of sediment. So what we're looking at basically is a circulation of sediment through the water. All right, so let's say it starts right here and oh, oh, there we are. It starts right here and comes in. And the water has to go somewhere. So this would be uh, basically, let's say there's a headland or a cape. And we, so there's a, you know, a, a large area of land and it juts out and the beach starts right here. So the beach is starting right here. So there is a geographic um starting point for this circulation cell this near shore or little cell and because of the wind and the currents and tides you have this this um movement of water just carrying the sediment in suspended load and bed load so it's through the water so it's suspended and bed load so the bed load is where the material gets pushed along the ocean floor, sea floor by currents, and a suspended load is based on the density and the mass of the material, but it is held by the water and is moved with the currents. So these two, these two are going to be the material, the unconsolidated material. That basically means little bits of separated material. Let's just use sand for now because that's the easy material to work with. So it's sand. So sand comes in, and then it reaches the coastline, reaches the shore through the surf zone, the breakers, the different types of waves, and based on the wave energy and the type of beach and the profile, you'll get the sand ended up at the point where the water hits the land, the beach. So you'd have the swash and the backwash move in, and depends on the uh, symmetry of the beach and the angle of which the uh, the energy and waves and currents are moving towards the coastline at, you might have a symmetrical uh, beach which is coming straight on like perpendicular, or you may also have an angled approach like this. And then the swash and backwash would be really very uh, pronounced angles of moving up the beach and back. Now we know that there is a balance between uh, the deposition, how much material is uh, built or constructed on the beach and how the beach can be produced and made versus the constructive, I'm sorry, versus the uh, destructive or the erosion. And the word we can use for deposition will be constructive. So the beach or the coastal zone is being built up with more sediment or it's being um, slowly broken down and taken away by the ocean, which would be erosion and be a destructive beach um, type. So the swash and buffalo are linked with the obviously movement of sediment up and down the beach. Um, are they the signs left there uh, through the swash? So it depends on the energy of the waves. Uh, and the height of the waves would, would create the different levels of swash versus the backwash, which is right here, 
the movement of the water and sediment going back down. Also, you can involve uh, percolation and infiltration through the sediment, through the through the, uh, the sand. Also depends on the grain size. So the smaller the grain size, uh, the less percolation you would have, the slower rate or velocity of infiltration, and the larger, more pebbly beach would have a larger volume of percolation. But that also will flow uh, back into the ocean water eventually, right, based on gradient and gravity. But the swash and backwash is very important, and the angle at which it happens is very important. If you have a symmetrical, more perpendicular straight line energy going into the beach, you would have um, basically the cell being very contained, maybe even a uh, very a smaller cell. If you'd have a asymmetrical or not symmetrical um, energy wave coming in with the currents and the tides and producing this angled approach with the swash and backwash, you would get a very extensive what's called long shore drift being created or longshore current. Now these would move parallel. You see that? Sorry, I'm use red instead. Use uh, move parallel because of the angle in which it's going. It will basically go parallel to the coastline um, in basically shallow water and be moving sediment along the beach, along the beach. So there will be movement onshore, which is this right here. This is onshore movement. And the backwash and any kind of rips or rip currents that could move the sediment back out into deeper water, into offshore areas. That is called offshore movement. And the longshore drift, that's not onshore, it's not offshore, it's called a longshore. So there's movement, there's movement of the sediment towards the land or out back to sea or along the coastline with longshore drift or longshore current. So to kind of like make this a little bit more straightforward, um, you have your coastline, you have your, uh, your land right here. You have your two headlands. And a headland over here. So there is uh, physical features that would define the coastline and create these cells. So cell would be a complete cycle circuit of movement of sediment. Now, you might have a um, river system coming through, let's say here, or um, over here or over here. Okay. Now the river system, fluvial system would, would basically contribute around 90% of the sediment that is transported in the ocean. So there's a definite, very large influencing um, link and connectivity between the water on land and the process of weather and erosion and the ocean uh, circulation, ocean movement of sediment. So this literal cell, okay, you have an input, you have a source. Now a source is where the material is coming from. So we discussed that, that the mostly a lot of the fluvial systems could also be from offshore bars, it could be a bar here, offshore bar accumulation. Or there could be a shoal. And you have this influx of sediment being transported by the ocean currents and waves. And the tides, depends on the type of, of, of beach, towards the coastline. And the headland would be that kind of, and the headland also would cause wave refraction as well. So you'd have this uh, most likely angled approach of the ocean currents as it approaches the coastline. And as it goes there, you'd obviously have the deposition of sand 
and material creating the beach and the different wave energy and, and season latitude and topography you get a type of beach that is or the beach profile or the beach uh, morphology would be created so in this case we've got obviously swash and backwash right here all right and we've got that longshore drift current Now, it's going to move this direction along the coastline. And it's going to basically bring a lot of the uh, suspended bed load material and sediment, and it's going to approach this next headland over here on the right-hand side. That's going to basically dump more of the sediment right here as it hits this headland. And what's going to happen is it's going to basically uh, have a movement because of the headland. It's going to be redirected and move back offshore so the same kind of cell that you might find in the atmosphere that you might find in the earth's interior that that constant cycling pattern of of movement basically with thermodynamics but you have here with sediment and the process of building sediment on the coastline with beaches and taking away sediment and uh depositing them offshore so you'd have an offshore, maybe a submarine canyon would be where this sediment is deposited. And this would be linked up with a passive uh, margin or a um, ground embarrament or old river delta. Depends obviously on the sea level, which would link up to the climate and the ice ages and the size and depth of the continental shelf is awesome you can, you can mix it in with all these different topics so within if you have more of a symmetrical um cell you'd have some nice rip currents that would come out here okay and the rip current the, the distance between rip currents is depend on the surf zone and the wave action and the amount of energy in that wave action would dictate the how many rip recurrence there are and also the strength of the recurrence now generally the longshore drift current is stronger than the rip currents so rip currents are still strong and can still move water at many meters per second but rip currents can be usually not as strong as longshore drift current so this can also uh, take um sediment away and create different offshore uh, features. Longshore drift can move all of the sediment and it can also start to form a spit up here, which could be one method of forming a barrier island or a tombolo, which is gonna connect an island to the mainland and, and be awesome that way. Or could just be a accumulation of sediment here. And then it can also uh, help to uh, maybe distribute some sand into the next cell, which would be over here on this part of the headland. So you usually find a secondary cell that would be, again, have wave refraction from the headland and start a new cell over here. You also could find there'll be a, a cell on this side, again, pushing sediment out to here again maybe, maybe forming this offshore bar and then come back in again to continue the cycle around the headland so like in southern california you might have these long connected cells that over time might have the movement of, of sediment going hundreds of miles along or down the coastline from let's say you know uh northern california and monterey down to san diego so to summarize, as you can see by this uh, top right hand uh, image right here, you have these uh, influenced cells by the coastal uh, terrain, the coastal geomorphology, where the headlands are, where the stacks are, or arches, um, where you have some of the coves or caves and you have this wave refraction. So you might have this interrupted cell right here, which is basically uh, going to continue along this way also depends on the surf zone and how large that cell is going to be and also depends on the availability of material could be 
based on the sand budget, how much sand is coming, how much material is coming off the land into the water, how much water, how much material is going back through the water, through the currents and wave action back to the beach as a nice balance. Also based on whether it is constructive or destructive. Could be based on uh, oh, that's not destructive. Could be based on season versus a winter kind of profile of beach versus a summer profile and prevailing wind direction, latitude, climate, uh, sea level changes, all that can play a large role. So look at the uh, left hand picture right here, a uh, picture of the west coast of Cornwall, Charles Porth Beach. We've got this very large headland right here, which would dictate wave refraction, wave direction, and of course. Uh, during low tide, it's very large tidal range. We'd have some, uh, maybe some slight longshore drift going uh, actually down towards the southwest. Here on this image on the bottom left, we've got this nice little spit that is occurring. So we can assume that there uh, can be some sort of deposition, large deposition here of sand, maybe even longshore drift moving this way to deposit the sand there because you had this kind of like corner here. So it could be a headland or even a corner. This could be an inlet right here where um, it's going to deposit some of the uh, sand here before going through the inlet, the tidal channel uh, of this uh, barrier island right here. So literal cells can be either symmetrical, right, and based on uh, coastal uh, topography, coastal uh, interruptions. It could also be uh, asymmetrical, which would be slanted at a side, which will basically promote more longshore drift, maybe promote more erosion or faster deposition towards the end of the longshore drift. This is based on the wave energy, based on currents and tides, the direction of wind, the um, coastal topography, and also the ocean floor. And this is highly linked up to two things, two types. So you've got train edge coasts, which are more passive, which are influenced or have uh, various characteristics like um, the submerged river uh, estuaries and deltas, like the uh, North American uh, East Coast, versus the collision, which would be a great example of an active uh, margin where there is active tectonics, maybe a, a convergent plate boundary, right there, which would be, again, uh, the U.S. West Coast, as mentioned with, uh, with California. And this would dictate whether it is a flat or cliffed coastline. It would also affect the wave energy. It would affect um, the depth of the water, the depth of the littoral zone, the gradient of the beach, and also the features. So let's say you'd have over here on the train edge, you'd have some barrier islands maybe some more sandbars and shoals uh, because of the, the very uh, gentle gradient versus a steeper gradient of the collision coast where with the coastline and the cliffs, maybe you have less um, sediment, you have less material because you have less erosion, maybe less rivers flowing into the ocean over a cliff. Um, you'd have uh, maybe some more wave action, but you'd also dictate the amount of sediment you have, and that would create also the, uh, the amount of beach that you would be forming as well. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, please join us again for another video on uh, coastal processes, and we'll see you soon.